Good morning and welcome to Ceramic Storytime with Sue. Um, I am just going to give you guys a bit of time to join me here today and I will just make sure my, um, my live video is working. This week I see it looks like I'm live so Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was just noticing that my um, my live video started before it told me it was live. So I was just staring at the screen. So anyways, um, it's always fun to see if my technology is going to work for me each week. Um, so if you join me um, and you would like to participate in this conversation, I'm going to be reading my blog post called uh, 12 Tips for Managing Glazes at a Busy Pottery Studio. Um, and so if you want to interact with me and comment, um, then you're welcome to. And I'll be reading the comments as I'm, um, as I'm talking here today. And so I can answer any questions that you have. Um, I'm just going to post a comment here. Um, so because I'm using a third party software called BeLive um, and due to Facebook restrictions, um, you have to give them permission for me to see your name attached to your comment. So if you want to click the link in the comment that I just posted below this video, then that just gives them permission so I can see who I'm talking to um, as we go here today. Um, and so if you're here, please say hello in the comments. Just let me know that you can see and hear me okay um, and that you are here. Maybe let me know where you are from and that would be great. Um, I, in the fall when I was doing story time, I was um, sharing my morning coffee cup, morning mug with you. So uh, this morning I wanted to share this mug um, that I'm drinking my coffee from. It was made by Freddie Ran and she's a potter in Vancouver. Um, so this is a wood fired cup and it was fired in the wood kiln at Shadbolt um, in Burnaby. So they have, they do community firings. Um, and so I bought this mug from her a couple of years ago at the Fired Up show in Machosan, um, which is close to Victoria, British Columbia. Um, so I thought, thank you, Freddie, for this lovely coffee mug that I'm drinking my coffee from this morning. Um, and so if we are going, um, then I'm going to share my screen here. Um, and please just say hello in the chat. Uh, let me know that you're here. And then I'm going to share. This is my blog post. So if you want to follow along, you can go to bit.ly forward slash busy pottery studio. And that will take you to this, um, this article on my website. Uh, and let me just hide this title so you can see uh, the screen better here. Um, so yeah, that link that's scrolling across the bottom of the screen, that will give you, um, that will take you to the blog post that I'm going to read for you today. So, okay. So it looks like I'm live. Um, so I'm going to continue and start reading this. So just feel free to jump in with any questions or comments that you might have, and I'm happy to answer them. Um, and so as you may or may not know, I've been the uh, ceramic studio technician at um, a busy pottery studio in Victoria, British Columbia. So it's a public studio at a rec center um, since 2015 is when I started working there. Um, so I just wrote this as a way if you're managing a pottery studio or if you're a technician um, or if you just have a lot of glazes that you are managing for yourself um, that uh, hopefully you can get some tips and tricks from me today. So glaze management 101. It's a lot of work to run a school or community pottery studio. There are a lot of moving parts to look after. I've been a studio technician for five years now, six actually, I should update that, for six years now. It's a very busy and rewarding job. 
As the technician, I'm taking care of all the behind the scenes tasks that go into running the studio. These include firing the kilns, maintaining the kilns and other equipment, keeping the studio organized, ordering all clay and glaze materials, and of course, maintaining all the studio glazes. Glaze maintenance can be a big job, especially if you have a lot of studio glazes and you're mixing them from scratch. What size buckets do you use? How do you store them? what to use for mixing them, how to show users what the glazes look like. You have to keep replenishing buckets that are running low. You have to replenish the water that evaporates from the glazes, which changes their thickness while leaving crusty glaze sludge on the sides of the bucket. Sometimes lids are left off the buckets. Sometimes things are dropped into the buckets. Sometimes the buckets are accidentally dumped on the floor usually containing red iron oxide, just to make cleanup more challenging. If you have a lot of studio users, and especially a lot of beginners, you're going to have people who don't mix the glaze quite well enough before dipping, which also changes the glaze's water content. Dipping into a glaze that's not mixed well leads to a higher proportion of water being removed from the bucket. You need to make sure the glazes stay at a consistent thickness so you can give accurate instructions to the users and they can have consistent results. If your glaze thickness is always different, people can't predict how the glaze will behave, which impedes their ability to improve their glazing. Adapting to a changing glaze bucket is a skill that can be learned, but for beginners, it's nice to have user-friendly glazes. It can be challenging to stay on top of all of these tasks if you don't have systems in place to make sure it's all getting done. I'm going to share with you all the practices that we use for our studio glazes and hopefully you can adapt what we do to work for your studio. We have 20 large buckets of glaze in our studio and around 250 users in our program at any given time. Uh, so that was pre-COVID. Um, our numbers are a lot lower now, um, but a year ago, that was the situation. <laughs> uh, we have four technis technicians on staff with at least one of us working every day of the week. And we have a team of six to 10 volunteers who trade their services for studio time. You may not have the time or resources to adopt all of the our glaze management practices, but take what you can. Hopefully you'll learn a tip or two that will help you improve your routine and make the glazes better for everyone using them. So tip number one, buckets on wheels. We use five gallon, 10 gallon and 20 gallon buckets in our studio. We mix 10,000 gram batches of glaze at a time and most glazes last one to two months before we need to make more. If you're making smaller batches, you may use a smaller bucket size. We keep our buckets on wheels in the studio so people can easily grab them, or pardon, so people can easily wheel them around without having to lift them. Some of our buckets, like the gray one shown above, so this gray one here, comes with special wheels that attach to the bottom. Some buckets, like the five gallon Home Depot buckets, sit on top of a rolling plant stand like this. Um, and this plant stand we order on Amazon and it can support up to 500 pounds. Um, so it's quite sturdy. Um, the wheels get a little bit stiff sometimes, uh, but for the most part, they work really well. For the safety of users, I would suggest using wheels for any bucket of glaze that's five gallons or larger. Um, and that's just for lifting, so they don't have to be lifting the buckets and moving them around the studio. If you're using smaller buckets, get buckets with metal handles. Don't use buckets with plastic handles. They will break eventually, guaranteed. Plastic breaks down over time, so I would never trust a heavy bucket with a plastic handle. Depending on what grade of plastic your bucket is made of, it will probably crack eventually too, especially if the plastic flexes when lifting the bucket by the handle. You want a sturdy enough bucket that holds its shape when lifted. If it does flex, it's better to hold the bucket by the bottom when carrying it. Keep an eye out for cracks forming near the rims and then replace them before they crack completely. 
When buckets are on wheels, they last longer because they aren't being lifted by the handle very often. Note, having, bucket, having buckets on wheels can make it easier to dump a glaze over, but the benefits outweigh the risks in my opinion. We have about two buckets spilled per year. Not a big deal, it happens. Uh, tip number two is test tiles on buckets. We make flat textured slab test tiles with holes in them to attach to the sides of the glaze buckets. Each glaze bucket has a tile of every clay body that we offer dipped in that glaze and fired in both oxidation and reduction. For us, that's eight test tiles per bucket. Um, so here you can see our clear glaze. So we've got four different clay bodies um, and then we fire them in oxidation in our electric kilns and then we also fire them in reduction in our gas kiln. So each bucket has eight test tiles. Uh, as examples to see what that glaze looks like. Uh, just checking the comments. Hi, Angela. Hi, Michael. Thank you for joining me here today. Um, so eight test tiles per bucket. This helps users see how the glazes look different on different clay bodies and in different firing atmospheres. The bucket test tiles are flat instead of L-shaped, so they're less awkward of a shape hanging off the bucket and less likely to break. So here's our clear glaze, here's our turquoise glaze on four different clay bodies. These are all fired in oxidation. Uh, tip number three, a test tile wall. We also have a wall of test tiles. Each test tile is first dipped in one studio glaze and then dipped in another glaze. We have an example of every glaze over and under every other glaze in the studio. We have one set fired in oxidation and one for reduction. So here is our test tile wall. It extends the whole length of the studio. Um, so we have oxidation glaze, glazes on this side and then the whole other side of this wall um, has all the reduction fired glazes. Uh, the test tiles are numbered and we have a chart that shows you which glazes were used on each test tile. So each tile was first dipped in the glaze in the left column. So here's our chart here. Um, and then, so it was first dipped in this glaze and then the bottom half of the tile was dipped in the glaze in the top row. So to read this chart, you can go, so right here we have number 29. So you can find number 29 here. And that tells us that this test tile here was first dipped in our white glaze. And then the bottom half was dipped in our SJC turquoise glaze. Um, so you can see the white by itself. And then you can see what it looks like with the turquoise, the SJC over top of the white. Um, and so we have an example of uh, every glaze over every other glaze and then every glaze under every other glaze. And so this is our chart. Um, so you people can either look at the wall and find a test tile and then see how it was made, or they can look at the chart and be like, hmm, I wonder what it looks like if I were to put uh, white over black. And then you can find the test tile that has that example. Uh, this test tile wall, this test tile wall is a huge undertaking and not something you see in every pottery studio. It was not my idea. It already existed when I started working there. It's great to be able to see how different glaze combinations look. The main drawback of this amazing test tile wall is that results can vary so much depending on the thickness of each glaze's application. Sometimes there is disappointment when a piece doesn't turn out like the test tile. It's important to communicate that the test tiles are just to give a general idea of a possibility and are not a guaranteed result. Uh, tip number four, hanging glaze mixing sticks. So we use large wooden dowels for our glaze mixing sticks. We also have a long handled toilet brush that's handy for scraping the glaze off the bottom since the wooden dowels aren't really that great at that. 
I would prefer it if our mixing sticks had more of a flat paddle-like end that was better at moving the glaze around the bucket and scraping the sides and bottoms, but this is what the studio has used for years and I haven't really had time to make any changes. My biggest tip for mixing sticks is to have one stick designated for each bucket of glaze. A lot of time and water is saved when you can have a stick in each bucket that you're using and you're not having to rinse every time you switch glazes. We label the sticks with the name of the glaze. We don't allow people to leave the sticks in the buckets because the wood will rot. They have a loop on the end so they can be hung to dry on handy hooks under the table. Um, so I've heard from a lot of you with lots of different suggestions for other types of mixing sticks that like made of plastic that can be left in the buckets. Um, so, so a lot of people mentioned these um, toilet brushes and they're, they're good. Um, the main complaint that we have at the studio when people use this toilet brush is that it doesn't get rinsed properly and then someone sticks it in another glaze. Um, and then you have a bit of contamination. Um, but they do work to like get all that sludge that's settled on the bottom and the sides and get that mixed into the glaze. Um, are the recipes for these glazes also available? Yes, um, I've published all of our studio recipes on glazy.org. Let me just post the link. Um, so it is lazy.org forward slash you for user forward slash Sue McLeod ceramics forward slash recipes. Um, and that's going to bring you to my um, collection of glaze recipes. And so any of the recipes in there that say Cedar Hill, um, those are our studio glazes. Um, and then I've also bookmarked um, so in Glazy, um, I have a bookmark, which is a collection of recipes. So if you click on my bookmarks and then click Cedar Hill glazes, then that will just take you to all of our studio glazes. <clears throat> all right. So tip number five, monthly glaze sieving. Each of our glazes gets sieved every month. We have a chart to track when each glaze was sieved. So here's our glaze sieving chart. Uh, on the column on the left, we've got each of the names of all of our individual glazes, and then we have room for the date. So each time a glaze is sieved, we write the date down, and then we just make sure that it's sieved again um, within a month. And so we just make sure that all of our glazes get sieved every month. This is one of the main tasks that our volunteers help us with. First, they mix the glaze with a drill and paint mixer attachment. Then they pour the glaze through an 80 mesh sieve into another bucket. The sieve is a talisman rotary sieve, like you can see here. Uh, they scrape the main bucket to get all the thick sludge and dried up crusty glaze off the sides and back into the mix. The bucket is rinsed, the lid is cleaned, and then the glaze is poured back through the AD mesh sieve into the main clean bucket. This keeps the glazes smooth and lump free and makes sure they're high speed mixed on a regular basis, helps us to remove the occasional foreign object from the bucket, and it keeps the buckets and lids clean. Dried up glaze on the side of a bucket turns to dust, which is a breathing hazard. So we try to keep the studio free from dried up clay and glaze as much as possible. Uh, number six, glaze level and thickness monitoring. Since the technicians aren't actively using the glazes, we rely on the users and volunteers to let us know when glazes are running low and if they seem thicker or thinner than usual. We provide a whiteboard so users can tell us when glazes need attention. There's a glazes running low section and then a glazes too thick or thin section on the whiteboard. People can write which glazes they want us to have a look at so we're not running around checking the buckets all the time. We suggest that they let us know before the glazes are too low to dip so we have time to mix a new batch. 
uh, mix and fire. So we always fire a test tile before we pour the new batch into the old bucket of glaze. We don't allow users to add water to glazes. That's always the technician's job. Otherwise, there can be a lot of conflicting opinions as to whether glazes need water or not. Technicians have a system for determining if a glaze needs water, which requires no opinions. That system is called measuring specific gravity. So tip number seven is monthly specific gravity checks. Technicians measure and adjust the specific gravity of each new batch of glaze when it's mixed. And we measure all the existing glazes every month to make sure the water level stays consistent. This promotes consistent application thickness for the users. Since water evaporates and glazes aren't always mixed to 100% homogeneity before dipping, it's common for the water content to go down and the glazes to thicken. By measuring and adjusting specific gravity, we make sure the water content stays the same. So here's an example of our sapphire blue glaze um, at two different specific gravity levels. And so that means they have different water content. So here, the glaze on the left, um, the specific gravity is 1.72. Um, and so you can see it's this bright blue color. And then here, um, so adding water brings the specific gravity number down. Um, and so the specific gravity here is 1.56. And um, as you can see, the glaze has thinned down so much that you lose that blue color. Um, and so the this glaze here with the least amount of water is also running and dripping. So you can see these big drips on the side. Um, so we want, uh, we want our glaze result somewhere in between this glaze and that glaze. Um, and we get that by actually flocculating this glaze. Um, but that is for another conversation. So when the water content is consistent, it's easier for teachers to give glazing instructions and it's easier for users to achieve consistent results. If the water content fluctuates, then telling someone to hold their piece in for three seconds won't always give the same result. If the glaze is too thick because water has evaporated, the glaze could run onto the kiln shelves, leading to disappointment for the maker and for the technician or volunteer who has to scrape the kiln shelf. The best way we can control the glaze thickness for a consistent application is to keep the water level consistent by measuring specific gravity. If you don't know how to measure specific gravity, please download my free guide with step-by-step -step instructions. Um, so if you're following along on this page, um, then you can click the link here. I believe the URL to um, download the guide is sumacloudceramics.com forward slash sg guide so sg for specific gravity guide um, and then you can enter your email address and then i'll send you this free guide with all the instructions um, and then there's also a video of me measuring specific gravity in this blog post if you click this link here um, if you're in the facebook group watching me right now um the the videos, there's videos of me measuring specific gravity. If you go to the unit section of the Facebook group, um, there's a whole bunch of uh, information and instructions for measuring specific gravity there as well. So we have a chart to keep track of when each glaze was checked, much like the glaze sieving chart. We write the target specific gravity values for each individual glaze on the chart. We came to these numbers through testing and figuring out how each glaze works best. <clears throat> Throughout the month, technicians chip away at measuring the specific gravity of all the glazes and mark the date on the chart. So it's basically the same chart as our glaze sieving chart. Um, and then we just mark the date just so we know that they've each glaze has been checked every month. Tip number eight mixing glazes by adding dry to wet. This tip comes from a safety perspective. As you probably know, most glaze materials contain silica dust, which is hazardous to our lungs. We must wear a respirator while working with these materials in their dry state. 
Once the materials are added to water, they can no longer float in the air and into our lungs. For this reason, getting your glazed materials wet as soon as possible will reduce the amount of dust in your working environment. When we mix a new glaze, we, um, we add dry to wet, meaning we start with water in the bucket weigh the dry materials, and then add them directly to the water rather than the other way around where you add all the dry materials to the bucket and then add the water. Adding dry to wet ensures the materials become wet right away and aren't creating unnecessary dust clouds each time a new material is dumped into the bucket. If you're working in a shared space where others who aren't wearing a respirator may walk into the room, either during or after glaze mixing, you need to do everything you can to control how much dust is released into the atmosphere. While this technique will reduce the amount of dust, it doesn't eliminate it completely, so always wear proper PPE, personal protective equipment, while mixing glazes from scratch. When mixing glazes dry to wet, it's important to add the clay, so the EPK ball clay or bentonite um, in the recipe to the water first so that the other materials don't hard pan on the bottom of the bucket. Um, and that's because clay is what keeps all the other materials in suspension. So if you were just to start by adding fritz and feldspars uh, to the water, then they're gonna settle on the bottom um, into like a rock hard layer. Um, and so if you add the clay first, then that helps to keep everything suspended so it can be mixed easily. Tip number nine, test each new glaze batch. When we mix a new batch of glaze, before we add it to the old batch, we fire a test tile to make sure the glaze was made correctly. 99% of the time, it's great, and we dump it straight into the main bucket. For those occasional mishaps, we have the opportunity to find our mistake and correct it, if possible, without contaminating the existing bucket of glaze. Uh, tip number 10, record when new glaze material bags are opened. Every time we open a fresh bag of glaze material, we mark down the date and the amount. The dates and amounts <clears throat> pardon, are added to a spreadsheet that totals how much of each material we've used over time and gives us a monthly average for each. I keep the monthly averages in, on my inventory sheet so I can easily compare how much we have left to how much we typically use each month. This helps me with ordering because we don't have much space for extra materials and we don't want to run out of anything either. Since I place a monthly order for clay and glaze materials, I can easily see at a glance whether we're likely to run out of something soon or if we have enough for a few months and I don't need to restock just yet. Tip number 11, record the quantities and costs for each glaze batch. We have a glaze mixing sheet for each of our glazes. Each sheet has the recipe written out with percentages and then columns for each batch that we make. So here's our glaze mixing sheet. So we write the name of the glaze up here. Um, we list the, uh, the recipe materials here um, and then colorants and additives go at the bottom with our percentages and then we batch them out. So if I was making a 10, thousand gram batch, then we would multiply all the percentages by a hundred to get um, the number of grams of each material that we need to add to the bucket. When we want to make 10,000 grams of a glaze, we batch it out on the sheet by multiplying each material percentage by a hundred to see how many grams we need to add to the bucket. I just said that. <laughs> uh, we keep track of the quantity of each glaze that we make over time. This helps us calculate our glaze costs per month based on how much material we're using as opposed to how much material we're ordering that may not be used right away. So this is my crazy uh, spreadsheet here. Um, so these are all months on the side column. And then um, each column here is a different glaze. And then we've got batch sizes. So it's really hard to see, but like uh, May of 2015, I made 10 
thousand grams of white. So I keep track of how much we're making of each glaze um, every month. And then uh, we keep running totals. And then that also helps us to determine which glazes are the most popular, um, that sort of thing. So you can input the cost of your glaze materials on glazy.org and it will calculate the cost of all your glaze recipes. The software takes your material costs and multiplies the cost by the percentage of that material in your glaze recipe. This way you can see how much a batch of your glazes, um, how much a batch of each of your glazes actually costs, whether it's a thousand grams or 10,000 grams. So here's a screenshot of glazy.org. So you can keep an inventory of your materials um, and you can write the price. So price per whatever unit. So if you buy it by the pound or by the kilogram. Um, and then, so as long as you have all the material costs of a glaze recipe inputted into Glazy, then your recipe is going to show you a cost per batch size, which is super handy. It can be eye-opening to compare the costs of different glazes. Since material costs vary so much, some glazes are way more expensive to make than others. If you're trying to cut studio costs, you may want to replace some of the more expensive glazes with cheaper ones. Recording the quantities of each glaze we're making also helps us to see which glazes are the most popular, which glazes don't get used very often. We can use this info to decide which glazes to keep and which glazes we might want to replace with new ones. And tip number 12, no outside glazes allowed in the studio. The last tip is a policy that we have at our studio. The users are required to use the glazes that we provide for them. We don't allow them to bring in outside glazes, whether they're commercial or made from scratch. This is to protect our kilns, kiln shelves, and other people's pots from unexpected glaze running. Regardless of whether it's a tried and true glaze or a commercial glaze rated for our temperature, we simply can't take the risk of firing glazes that we haven't tested. Considering how busy our studio is, we don't have time to test glazes for anyone. I would love it if that was my job to test glazes for people, but it's not feasible at our studio. We have to be able to offer the same service to everyone, so it's just a hard no every time. Having a policy like this keeps the kilns clean because we always know exactly what's being fired in them. We also don't allow outside clay bodies. All clay must be purchased at the studio. We offer 20 different glazes plus stains and colored slips and under glazes now that can be layered and combined in an infinite number of ways so studio users are encouraged to get creative when they become bored of what we have to offer. A lot of glaze to manage. So there you have my 12 tips for managing glazes at a, at a busy pottery studio. I certainly don't do all of this in my home studio. It's easier to keep track of glazes when there's just one person using them. I definitely do the specific gravity checks though, every time I glaze. Here is this, a summary of the 12 tips. Number one, buckets on wheels. Number two, test tiles on buckets. Oh, my numbering's off here. <laughs> Number three, test tile wall. Number four, hanging glaze mixing sticks. Number five, monthly glaze sieving. Number six, glaze level and thickness monitoring. Number seven, monthly specific gravity checks. Number eight, mix, mix glazes by adding dry to wet. Number nine, test each new glaze batch. Number 10, record when new glaze material bags are open. Number 11, record the quantities and costs for each glaze batch. And number 12, no outside glazes allowed in the studio. So I am happy to take any questions that you have. Um, just type them in the comments. I hope you found this valuable, whether you manage the glazes at a busy studio or not. It's always interesting to see how other people do things at other studios. So that completes my blog post for today. 
Um, thank you all for joining. I'll just give one minute for, um, for any questions to come in. Uh, Joan says, thank you. And um, yeah, if you're watching the replay, just feel free to comment. And um, I always check back to make sure that I answer any questions after the fact. Um, and with that, if there are no questions, then I will let you guys go and enjoy the rest of your day. Um, it's kind of stormy here on Vancouver Island, so I'm hoping that we don't lose our power again. Uh, we had a bit of snow last night, um, so it's always a little bit nerve-wracking when the weather gets a bit hairy. So uh, thank you, thank you so much for joining, and I will see you next week for Storytime. <laughs>